dun, 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 dun. I just want to say for the recording one more time, I like Dr. Groove. <laughs> Dr. Groove. <laughs> Mr. Muppet Man. Here we go. Welcome to Behavioral Grooves. My name is Kurt Nelson. And I'm Tim Houlihan. Behavioral Grooves is the global podcast that shares conversations with researchers who have cool ideas, practitioners who have outstanding applications, and accidental behavioral scientists who put all the best thinking into to their work, but just without the behavioral science terminology. And we have fun doing it, don't we, Kurt? Uh, y- yeah, I Yes, of course we have fun doing it. We get to talk to some of the most interesting people on the entire planet, and this episode is no exception to that. Isn't that the truth? But before we get to our incredibly amazing guest, we want to tell you about something that we've been working on, and it's a virtual conference that we're calling Nudge It North, and it happens on Friday, January 8th, 2021. It's just a couple of months away, and we want to invite you to sign up right now. Yeah, Nudge It North is a global virtual conference that will bring behavioral science insights to practitioners in all sorts of fields, but especially fields such as marketing or HR or UX, CX design. So get out there and sign up now. Yeah, it's going to be a fabulous one-day event uh, with keynotes that are just going to knock your socks off, breakout speakers with amazing insights, and high-quality networking opportunities in a virtual setting that you're simply not going to get anywhere else. Our speakers come from around the world, and we think Nudge It North is going to be great. It is going to be great. And if you want to hear great insights from some of Behavioral Groove's coolest guests, you'll want to make sure you get signed up at nudgeitnorth.com. Our keynote speakers will be using a fireside chat model, and they include some of our former guests such as Annie Duke, Gary Latham, and Robert Cialdini. They are amazingly insightful people and great speakers. So jump out now and go out to nudgeitnorth.com and get yourself on the list to get registered. Yeah. So let's take a quick look at these these keynote speakers. In case you don't already know, Annie Duke is one of our favorite guests with books such as Thinking in Bets and her latest, How to Decide. Annie's approach to decision-making stands on the shoulders of the greatest researchers, and she always has insights to share that everyone can learn from. Right. Gary Latham is one of the co-creators of goal setting theory along, along with Ed Locke. And as amazing as that is, Gary has extended his research into goal setting by looking at the unconscious motivation that exists with primes. He's the prime guy now. He, he like yes. talks about socks and priming. Oh, no, that's me. Anyway, <laughs> but he's a great presenter and we're looking forward to having him do this keynote. Yeah. And lastly, the amazing Robert Cialdini is our third keynote speaker. And Bob is the author of Influence, which is a book that has sold more than 30 million copies worldwide. And it's all about ethical persuasion and ethical approaches that contain insights that honestly can inform both our home and our work lives. Right. And he's also the author of Persuasion, which is another fantastic book on maybe some priming things. I don't know. It's just maybe (laughs) one of my my little... Pet peeves, or not Could pet be. peeves, but pet, uh, what's the just, opposite of pet peeve? Just pet things, <laughs> just pets. <laughs> All right, but Tim, in addition to those three keynotes, we're going to have uh, other outstanding speakers with uh, great credentials, right? Researchers with years of work on incentives, the past head of UX from PayPal and Target, the VP of Behavioral Science at MadPow, the leader of Behavioral Science at Spotify. The lineup is amazing, and it is we're adding more great speakers uh, every day, every week. Yeah. Nudge It North is going to be fantastic. And we encourage each of you in whatever country you're listening, just to jump out to nudgeitnorth.com and check out the site. Okay. On with this episode. Bill Von Hippel is an evolutionary psychologist from Alaska, but who has lived in Australia for the past 20 years. He was recommended to us by Roy Baumeister, and Bill's focus is to connect the way in which our species has evolved into our present day behaviors, from how we might have acted millions of years ago uh, to what we do today. His insights are clever, thoughtful, and thought-provoking. Ooh, Bill spoke to us about reciprocity, collectivism, and most importantly, how being cooperative and social propelled our species forward well beyond anything else in the animal kingdom. We talked about Bill's latest book, The Social Leap, and we think it's a groundbreaking book that applies 
evolutionary science to help us understand how major challenges from our past have shaped some of the most fundamental aspects of our current and present life. Aside from being a terrific writer, Bill is a terrific guest, and we hope that right now you sit back with a fine glass of evolutionary psychology and enjoy our conversation with Bill Von Hippel. Welcome, Bill Von Hippel, to the Behavioral Grooves podcast. Thank you. <laughs> we start <laughs> off, as always, with a speed round. So I'm going to start with the easiest one that you're going to get, which is coffee or tea? Coffee. All right. Would you prefer to have dinner with your favorite sports star or your favorite musician? Favorite musician. Oh, that was quick. Good, good there was call. no, no yeah. even, no, no hesitation. Easy. Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> Bruce Springsteen. Oh, yes. yes. The boss. All right. Okay. He would be interesting, wouldn't he? He would be oh, a fascinating guy to just sit down and, and totally. have a beer and, and eat dinner with. I think it'd be great. I'm st- yeah, I'm still waiting for him to answer my email. <laughs> <laughs> well, when he listens to this show, I'm sure he'll give you yes, a call back. Agreed. There you go. Totally. All right. Would you prefer to learn a new language or a new instrument? New instrument. Mm. Ah, another thing we're going to talk about later. Uh, <laughs> last question. Last question in the speed round. Is pondering the good life a blessing or a curse? You know, that's a tough one because it's a blessing for some and a curse for others. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. Why is why is that the case? And and of course, this is related back to uh, some research that you've you've published that we found particularly fascinating. But and you might mm-hmm. want to start talking a little bit about that if you would. Sure. So basically, um, you know, if you think about evolution, there's both natural selection, which is survival of the fittest, and there's sexual selection, which is the process of trying to attract and keep a mate. And both of those are critically important because. Um, Reproduction is the currency of evolution. No matter how long of a life you lead and how healthy you are, if you don't um, mate and pass on your genes, then you're evolutionarily irrelevant, even if you know you're morally or otherwise quite relevant. And so, the the key to sexual selection is is to try to be at least as good as the people around you, right? Because it, it kind of doesn't matter how good you are. What it matters is how you stack up to those who are close around you. Because if you're if you stack up better than them, you'll get picked by somebody to be their partner. And if they stack up better than you, you won't get picked. Mm. The, the end result of that process is that we're constantly engaged in social comparison. We're constantly looking around to see how well we stack up to others. And our happiness is very heavily determined by this. If we stack up well, we're happy and we are content with our lot in life. And if we don't stack up well, we're not. And it doesn't even really matter objectively how we're doing. It matters how we fare in that comparison process. And so, if pondering the good life makes you feel like everybody around you has got it better than you do, it's a really bitter experience. But if pondering the good life and, and reflecting on your existence makes you realize you've got it as good or better than, than the people around you, well, then it's really satisfying. Is that a completely subjective measure? Look, it is and it isn't. So, the, um, on the one hand, you know, we're lucky as humans that there's more than one way to attract a mate. You know, if you were a dung beetle, uh, you would basically have to push a very large ball of poo. And if you weren't strong enough to do it, uh, she's not interested. And so, so that's it, right? And, and I, I wouldn't be much of a dung beetle because I'm not big and strong. But as a human, you can use lots of different attributes. You can use a sense of humor. You can use your kindness. You can use your ability to play an instrument. You can use lots of different things to attract a partner. So on the one hand, there's some subjectivity. We can choose the domain that's the most important to us, that we stand out in the most positive way and reflect on that and reflect on our life happiness. And that's a really good thing. So we don't all have to compare ourselves on a single standard, which of course, if you did, many, many people would fail. But on the negative side, there it, it has to be something in which you're positively distinct. And so if the people around you are more positive in those domains than you are, no matter how wonderful you are, you're going to um, feel bad about yourself. So how idiosyncratic is that? So you're talking about people in general, like looking vastly, but can I pick, all right, humor, I'm not the, the funniest guy, but hey, relative to my three closest friends, I'm funnier than they are, right? How does that yes. play into it? Yeah, that plays into it a lot because your closest friends are actually the ones who matter the most. Because of course, you know, if we all stacked ourselves up against Leo DiCaprio or something, no one would ever be interested in us. But it doesn't even matter. It doesn't matter anyway, because I don't even know his friends, much less his girlfriends. And so the 
what, but what does matter is our closest friends because the, the women, you know, in my case, I'm a guy. So the women who are hanging out with me and my friends, well, they might pick me and they might pick my friends. So the, it is that, that is the key and relevant comparison. And then of course, what we can do is we can choose a domain in which we happen to be better than they are. So if they're better than us in five out of six, but we have that sixth domain, <laughs> we can say, well, that's what's really important. And we can try to focus on that. And fortunately for our happiness, we tend to do that. All right. So I can play tiddlywinks and practice my tiddlywinks really, really good. <laughs> and I know my well, friends aren't look, practicing there, but that's not a relevant factor, is it? Is that that? So it doesn't really make that... Yeah, I don't want to throw a spanner in the works of your plans because I do like the way you're thinking. <laughs> but um, but the thing is, most women aren't attracted to tiddlywinks, and so you'd be better off sticking with the domain that at least somebody cares about. Got it. Got it. That's, yeah, a, that's a really important yeah. thing. So tell us yeah. a little bit about your book. You got the the Social Leap, uh, newer mm-hmm. book that's out. Tell us a little bit about this because mm-hmm. this gets into some of this stuff, right? Yes. Yeah. It takes. Um, this is what we were just discussing. Is chapter four of the book actually, and so. What the book is about is it's called The Social Leap because it's focused on how it is that we became human. Um, it, it Basically, what it does in the beginning of the book is it rewinds the tape about six or seven million years ago when we um, – when we were basically our common ancestor with chimpanzees. So we don't know exactly what that ancestor looked like, but all the data suggests it looked pretty much like a chimp looks today. And so then we split apart from them about six or seven million years ago because of um, drying out of the rainforest on the east side of the Great African Rift Valley. The, um, that Rift Valley is tectonic activity that's, that's basically the two plates of Indula Africa tearing apart. And um, though on the east side, it's also elevating, and so it's drying out the rainforest. So our ancestors are those chimp-like beings that got caught on the east side, and then as the forest slowly dried up, they had nowhere to go. So eventually, they were in the no-choice condition, and they had to go down to the ground and try to make a living on the savanna. That would have been really hard for a long time, more than happy to discuss the details. But eventually, what you got to is... Um, a, by three and a half million years ago, we're Australopithecines, and we now, because we're bipedal, our bodies have changed in some important ways that allow us to protect ourselves. Again, more than happy to chat about how this works. But the key to that is that we have to band together and cooperate. Mm-hmm. And chimpanzees don't do that very well, but humans do that incredibly well. And so that's why it's this social leap. It's kind of this leap out of the rainforest, but at the same time, obviously metaphorical, it took three million years, but it's also social because what the solution that we latched upon the the what what started us again on our way to the top of the food chain was this social cooperativeness this capacity for collective action and that really changed everything both from how we live um and and where we were in the food chain to the size of our brains as well so the book is about that process and then how it manifests itself in the modern world how it predicts things about our psychology today so as someone living in the united states i i think about our society is being the least collective as any other human species right now, uh, mm-hmm. a human society right now. And it's, yeah. it's, and, and yet, I mean, you make a case in the book that it was this, um, this change from the rainforest to the savanna that, that endows the, the human species, you know, with this collectivism. Um, yes. Am I just being too narrow-minded as this, as an American thinking, oh no, my God, you know, no, we're so damn not. individualistic. <laughs> you, you both, I would say you're both right and wrong. So on the one hand, you're absolutely right. We're the, America is one of the most individualistic cultures on earth. There are a few others. Um, Australia, where I'm living now, is very individualistic, um, parts of Europe, etc. cetera. Um, and, but the, and this is a very modern phenomenon. No one was an individualist when we were all hunter-gatherers. But as we start to live in cities, and we're therefore surrounded by strangers, as we start to live in heterogeneous societies where people have different views, it pushes people toward individualism. And look, there's a lot of positives about individualism. You have a lot of autonomy. You can do what you want rather than what others expect of you. And so societies tend to shift toward individualism in the modern world, and they rarely shift in the opposite direction, if, if ever. But on the other hand, we're still very collectivist because autonomy is one super important force, but so is relatedness. And if all you have in the world is autonomy and you don't feel any connection with anybody else, you're not a happy individual. Now, that's a super lonely state of being. Now, in the United States right now, the, the country's really riven by political conflict with the two sides at each other's throat all the time. 
But but what you actually have is two forms of collective action. You've got these two in groups fighting what they regard as these the opposite, the out group, and that's that's a very common form of a collective action that's existed by two million years ago. Our ancestors, our Homo erectus ancestors had now um, moved back to the top of the food chain. They could plan for the future. They had division of labor, and those made their groups some of the most effective and deadly groups on the planet. As a consequence, the big predators on the savannah were no longer a threat to us, and really the only threat that remained to us was other groups of hominins, in this case, other Homo erectus, and then eventually other Homo sapiens. And so the end result of that is that we tend to form these in-group and out-group dynamics where we feel really tight connections to our in-group, but we regard our out-group as an important threat because, of course, our out-groups have been important threats to us for at least two million years. So how do you – so thinking about that, you see all of these parallels with what's going on today, at least in the United States. Uh, how does that translate? So, I mean, are we so stuck with our evolutionary DNA that we're not able to overcome those in-group, out-group type things? Or how do we go about, or is there any way that you know of that we can go about and, and, and transcend that, overcome that? Yeah, that's a great question. It's super hard to transcend that. And so on the one hand, we try really hard, and Peter Singer talks about expanding our moral circle and including groups that you traditionally wouldn't have included before, and then eventually even including other beings on this planet. And humans have done a great job of doing that, and we care a great deal now about the rights of others. But deep lurking inside us, there's still that um, in-group, out-group dynamic, and it's hard to overcome. And the time that it'll manifest itself most strongly is when, whenever we're in intergroup conflict. And mm -hmm. so the, the example I remember most notably when I was teaching at Ohio State University um, during the first desert storm when, when Bush Sr. organized that coalition against Iraq. And I remember this kid wore to class this t-shirt that said, I came all this way to smoke a camel. And what it had on the photograph or the photo, the drawing of the t-shirt was a um, a sight, like looking through the sight of a gun, and there was a caricature of an Arab on a camel. And so if you think about this incredibly dehumanizing image that, the, that he's making a joke out of using the superior Western technology to kill somebody, right, to smoke a camel. And so nobody would, nobody would ever wear such, wear such a dehumanizing racist t-shirt at any other time. But suddenly when we're in conflict with Iraq, which we hadn't even cared about 20 minutes before all that event, we would have had no opinion about them whatsoever, except maybe kind of liking them because they had been in conflict with Iran, who had taken mm -hmm. our, um, dip, dip, um, our diplomats hostage. Well, suddenly that's okay. And, and he doesn't think twice about wearing it. And I'm sure nobody gave him any crap all day long, right? And so it, it's really hard. It's hard. It's easy enough to keep it out of our minds when things are good. But when groups come into conflict, it's really hard to keep that down. Wow. Yeah, it, 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 it's just amazing. I, I want to go back to, uh, you, you talked about uh, natural selection and sexual selection. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, sort of in popular literature, we or popular conversations we th we talk about well our ancestors really just needed to worry about staying alive you know reproducing and uh eating you know finding mm -hmm. food uh is that is that a fair <laughs> really gross summary but is that a fair summary of of what our our ancestors really needed to do is was it really that simple or you know did they have a lot of leisure time to sit around and kind of think about well i might i might do some other things yeah, so on the one hand, they were in a constant battle against um, the elements of predators and probably most important of all pathogens. And so if you look at the survival curves of our ancestors, you can see that about 40% of humans didn't make it to adulthood. And that doesn't look notably different from chimpanzees. So, mm. you know, we are fighting it out in the forest just like everybody else. Um, we tended to, if we got to adulthood, we tended to live longer than chimpanzees. And one of the main reasons for that is we're kinder to each other. And so if a chimpanzee breaks its leg, they're like, oh, well, sorry, Bob. And off they go. Um, whereas if a human breaks his leg, typically that person's closest friend or family nurses them back to health and then they're fine. So there are important ways that we had advantages over um, our nearest relatives. But, um, but on the other hand, the, the life of a hunter-gatherer is not a bad life. If you accept, you know, the, the pre-medical side of it was really hard. But if, but if you look at the actual life they live, they worked about eight hours a day. But that working includes preparing meals, cleaning up after meals, preparing, um, 
uh, preparing tools and fixing them. And so they're, you know, if we think about the work that we do during a day, typically we're working eight hours a day and then we've got another four hours a day meals and all the other kind of things that we have to do. So they actually led an easier life than we lead in the sense of uh, the actual work a day. Mind you, this is tropical hunter gatherers and these are immediate return societies because they can't really worry about tomorrow. They don't, you, you can't do anything about tomorrow because if you kill an extra animal, it'll be rotten in, in the hot weather. So they, they really, they ate today what they killed today and tomorrow they dealt with when it came. Well, uh, Maeve Leakey, uh, a few years ago, I, I got to see her uh, talk, and she talked about the the, the general development going from uh, bipedalization, uh, which led to uh, to the manual dexterity, which led to greater encephalization. And mm -hmm. um, and if uh, is that is the encephalization in some ways um, sort of. Um, not just the catalyst, but is also sort of the recipient of having more time, more idle time, and more available time to do stuff with? Well, yes and no. So look, first of all, of course, I don't know. And we're just taking little bits and bobs of data and doing our best to figure out the narrative, right? And so what I tell you could easily prove to be wrong. But but based on the data that we have now, manual dexterity clearly is very important. You know, primates are way smarter than zebras. Um, what are you going to do with a pair of hooves? And what are you going to do if you eat grass? There's not a whole lot of reason to have big brains. And there's not a lot you can do with them. And there's not a lot you, you can do to pay the rent on them. So manual dexterity is super important. Octop octopuses are also very smart. But that only gets you so far. And if you look at uh, the, the extraordinary advances in our brain's size over the last, and therefore capacity over the last 3 million years, a big part of that story, um, I think, is the social side. And, and the reason for that is that if you look at chimpanzees, they're, they're super smart, but of course, nothing compared to us. And their problem is that the they're constantly competing with each other. They don't cooperate well at all. They will on rare occasions when they have to, but it breaks down really quickly. Whereas humans cooperate incredibly well. Now, why does that matter? Well, once you cooperate incredibly well, once you can work together as a team, now there's an advantage if you're a little bit smarter because you're not just working as a team kind of haphazardly, but rather you can start having division of labor. You could work as a team in a planful way by thinking about the future. Chimpanzees cannot envision a world with unfelt needs. So they can only envision a world with the needs that they have right now. Well, you can't plan if that's if that's your limited mental capacity. And so once you get to division of labor, suddenly groups have emergent properties. Once you get to planfulness, which of course is required for division of labor, you groups have emergent properties. And now you can start to, being smarter can allow you to get more calories and pay the rent on that bigger brain. And so the extraordinary increase in brain size that we've, we've experienced over the last three million years is really, has manual dexterity had to play a role because without that, we wouldn't have, there'd be nothing we could do with the big brains, but it only got us to where we were as chimps. To get from chimps to where we are now, it was that social side, that working together once we already had the things like manual dexterity. Yeah, I wanna go back. You talked about how how Bob the chimpanzee breaks a leg, you know, <laughs> sorry, Bob, right? We're, we're yep. gonna leave you on there. But it, so again, and, and, and for humans, we didn't do that. We, we take care of Bob if Bob breaks a leg, but that takes energy, it, it takes resources. So what is the, what's the evolutionary uh, advantage of taking care of Bob who, who broke a leg and, and may cause us to all, you know, suffer more because of that? Yeah, so that's a great question. So um, Michael Tomasello talks about this a lot in the sense that what we probably had going on in the early days, and again, we don't really know, but the logic mm -hmm. is consistent. And it's, it's also consistent with if we look at modern hunter-gatherers today, is that we people tend to have, and chimps even do this too, they have friends. But, mm. but the key thing about our friends is that we like to hunt with them and we like to do tasks with them. Chimpanzees prefer to hunt alone, except when they're hunting monkeys and therefore lots of them around has a better chance. But they, they prefer to forage on their own. Um, human beings prefer to forage with somebody else. And we often have long-term well-established hunting partners. Once you get to that situation, then the person that you're hunting with has real value to you. You guys know how to hunt well together. You guys share nicely. You've chosen them. The data show that you don't just choose them because they're a good hunter, but you also choose them because they're generous and because they're kind and they have, they, they're looking out for you in the same way you're looking out for them. Once you've got all that, you're pretty invested in that person. And so if they break your le a leg, you could say, well, see you, Bob. 
But actually, if you could nurse them back to health, you're better off than if you try to form a new relationship with somebody else who may or may not be as generous, who may or may not hunt well with you, et cetera, or who may or not, may not even want you to join their team, so to speak. Yeah. Now, th there's a lot of fluidity in these relationships, but there's also a lot of long-term stability. And that long-term stability would have made it a good investment. It's, you can think of it in terms of reciprocal altruism. It's actually money well spent in trying to get Bob nursed back to health. I was actually thinking about uh, there's been some recent looking at at the NBA. I'm a big basketball fan. And so teams that that are have spent longer together tend to do better in the regular season, but especially they do better in um, playoffs and they, they 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 go further in the playoffs much more than they would predict from their um, normal normal playing uh, games win uh, loss record. So it's that familiarity in what they're they're saying is it's that familiarity. I, I know where you know Bob is going to be on the court and he knows where I'm going to be on the court much better than if we were new. And so we we play better in those situations. Sounds like you're saying people hunt better. We we got along better, and so that it, it added that value to it. So. Yeah, I think that's right. And in fact, I would add that there's also a, a necessary generosity if you're a superstar to hand off the ball when you may have been able to sink it yourself. But if you know the guy and like the guy and you know that he's also generous with you under the right circumstances, then if the odds are a little bit better to hand the ball off, then you're going to hand the ball off. Whereas if you don't know him that well or like him that much and don't have that long history of re reciprocity, you might say, no, I'm, I'm taking this to the hole, right? <laughs> yeah, oh, that's yeah. a good one. Yeah, <laughs> that's fantastic. You wrote a piece about uh, detecting deceptive behavior after the fact, mm -hmm. and and you did some some experiments where you had people, uh, you know, s struggling with uh, you know a, a problem, and uh, and then you and you had uh, uh, someone within each of the groups. Uh, basically working against the group, right? Yep. Providing bad information. Yep. And uh, and if I understood the, the study correctly, it was later, it, people in, in the moment were, were having a hard time recognizing that this person was a Confederate or that they were working against them. But later mm -hmm. they could, oh yeah, I, you know, I saw it later. Um, and so uh, it, it got me thinking about uh, motivated reasoning and how we mm -hmm. deal with with deceptions today. Mm -hmm. And uh, because there's a lot of people who are seem to be very comfortable with dealing with deceptive information uh, today and accepting it. Um, mm -hmm. Do I, do, am, am I following that, that right, Bill? Yeah, you're definitely following right. Uh, the, um, th that study was all about creating a sabotage situation, you know, having a saboteur and then seeing if people could identify them. And, and what was fun about that study was that not a single person recognized that there was a saboteur in their group who was undermining them as they did this group decision task out of the hundreds of people we ran through the study. But then the moment we said, by the way, there was a saboteur, you're now going to all interview each other and try to figure out who it is. And of course, the saboteur is motivated to not be found. We're paying everybody. We're paying people money if they could find the person and we're paying the person if he could not be found, right? Um, <laughs> and it was all, it was all good fun. But the, 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 once we told them there's a saboteur, they were way better than chance of going, you know what, now that you say that, Bob here has been kind of fishy this whole time. And so human beings are pretty good at, um, at looking for intentions and trying to figure out what underlying motives are, even if we kind of sail along through everyday life without really trying to do that because it's not on our horizon. Yeah. Well, now we know why Bob has a broken leg. Um, but <laughs> that damn Bob. <laughs> yeah, he's causing troubles all the time. <laughs> so, so what does that? So, all right. So, so we're not good at detecting a saboteur, a, a liar, when in the moment, if we're not expect, if we're not mm -hmm. actively looking for it. Mm -hmm. But once we are, then our our we're we're pretty good. We're better than 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 chance at that. So, is there anything that we can do? Uh, any insights from that that we can do and take that insight from after the fact and applying it to while we're in the moment? Yeah. Um, look, here's the tricky bit. You don't want to go through your life suspicious of your friends. <laughs> it, 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 in truth, you just don't. It, it's sort of like we, we think of this in evolutionary terms as, as hawk dove problem. And so whenever you've got um, some kind of uh, violator of cooperativeness, whenever you've got some parasite, someone who's exploiting you, 
you can put a lot of energy into trying to detect them, but you're going to end up with a lot of false positives. And so mm -hmm. I think the best analogy is if you look at cuckoo birds and how they lay their eggs in other birds' nests. So cuckoos are their nest parasitizers. Then raising a baby bird is an enormous effort. It's like raising a baby human because they can't get out of the nest. They can't fly. And so birds tend to pair bond just like humans do often for life, just because it's so hard to raise the babies that they need both parents bringing worms and whatever they eat all the time. So cuckoos short circuit that problem by sneaking up and laying their eggs in another bird's nest. And then when their baby is born, the parent puts all its effort into raising some other baby's bird. You know, it's even a different species in this case. Now, it's really bad for the parent birds. The cuckoo baby often kicks all the real proper birds out of the nest, the ones who belong. And so it's the only one that gets raised. And so the parents lose all their offspring in raising somebody else's offspring. But this strategy, you'd think, well, why don't they just get smarter and get more capable of detecting it and be more suspicious. Well, it turns out that because they're not as cognitively sophisticated as we are, it's very difficult for them to differentiate the cuckoo from their own offspring. The, net, the eggs, have they've evolved to lay eggs that look very similar. But if you get enough cuckoo birds in the area, then the, 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 parent, the birds who are being parasitized will start to notice, they'll pay close attention. Now they'll kick out a few, fair few of their own eggs on accident, but they'll do a much better job of getting rid of the cuckoo egg. When cuckoos are very rare, it's not worth them doing that because they it, they have to kick out some of their own eggs too in order to get that mm -hmm. right. And so they're paying a pretty high price for a relatively rare event. In the same sense, if you're suspicious of your friends all the time, they're not going to like you very much. You're cognitively busy trying to figure out what they're really doing. You're not just going along and being cooperative. And so that suspicion has a cost. It's, it's a cognitive drag on your machinery that makes you a less effective group member. And so it's really only worth doing under those rare circumstances where there's good reason to believe that somebody's actually probably trying to sabotage the group. Got it. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I love that. So, um, in other words, I my my suspicion of Tim all these years is just <laughs> hasn't really helped me. Uh, is Look, that what first I'm I want to tell you, but Tim has been setting you up for years. I just <laughs> all of us on the internet are watching this going, "How could you not see this?" Oh, damn it! No. I knew it. I knew it. Sorry, Tim. Oh, sorry, uh, sorry. I had to tell. <laughs> You're going for worst guest ever here. I mean, this is <laughs> I'm a scientist. Oh my it's my responsibility to tell the truth. <laughs> That's true. Very true. So speaking of which, I, I'm wondering if uh, when you think about this this broad library of, of research that you've done, are there any any things that, that you've come across in, in, in your own research that you felt like sort of the world at large what just didn't really pay proper attention to where there was there ever a, an effect that you found or or some cool correlation or that was like oh man this is so great why don't the re why doesn't the rest of the world get it is there anything out or things maybe there's a, i don't know there's dozens of things out there that you're feeling that way well, look, I mean, you know, we always love our own research papers, right? Because they're sort of our babies and we think, boy, they're going to go off and, and the world's going to love them too. And um, instead, the world, you get the sort of Seinfeld response, ooh, that's breathtaking, <laughs> um, rather than the kind of response you hope for. Um, or another metaphor is you've tossed a rock into a lake and there's been virtually no ripples that just disappeared. So look, of course, I... I feel that lots of the stuff that I do is fun and then the world maybe doesn't care. Um, if I had to bring up a single example, I would say that one thing that I've been surprised by in my own research, and this is work I'm not doing very – well, I'm doing a little bit of it still. I was doing more of it before, but it's it's how important our control abilities are in, in social functioning. And so, you know, I always thought, well, mental control is really about not just just not saying the wrong thing. And so I have a <clears throat> I have a bad habit of blurting out whatever occurs to me, which gets me into trouble sometimes. But and I always thought, well, that's where what our mental control is designed for to stop us from blurting these things out. Excuse me. <clears throat> but what the, what the data actually suggests that, that we've been gathering is that mental control actually serves a really important function of keeping ideas that you don't want in your head out of your head as well. You can think of them as mental contamination. And so, for example. Um, we found that one of the things that we know as you age is that the frontal lobes of your atro of your brain atrophy more rapidly than some of the other parts of your brain. And that's where the control functions lie. And so we found that as people age, one of the things that happens is they actually get more prejudiced and they don't want to be more prejudiced. But what, but the, our society is suffused with stereotypes of other groups, you know, intergroup relations are always fraught. And so 
that stuff bubbles to the surface a, a lot. And we use our inhibitory abilities to push it back down and think, no, just because this person is a member of group X doesn't mean I know what they're like. Let me learn about them and let, let me form a, you know, an evaluation based on the person and not the group. But as you get older and it gets harder to inhibit, we find that people unintentionally start stereotyping more. And as a consequence, they can actually become prejudiced against their will. So this is an idea that that I was surprised how far it carried and, and how big of an impact it had because it even manifests itself in domains where you don't even know you're relying on your stereotypes, where they're coming up implicitly. Even then, the if you have poor inhibitory control, they start it leaks into your um, mind more and it has a bigger influence on your judgment. That's fascinating. Uh, is there anything we can do about it? Well, yes and no. I mean, the one thing is that we can become very aware of it, right? The one good thing, lots of times when you're aware of the problem, it doesn't help. You just, you know, the you know that you accidentally rely on these heuristics when you make decisions and then you make someone aware of it and they, they do it even more. They just can't stop themselves. Yeah. Um, this is a case where if you slow down a little bit, you can say, well, wait a minute, why am I reacting this way to this person? Is it because of who they are or is it because of their group membership? You know, their gender or sexual orientation or any of a wide variety of things. And if you ask yourself that question honestly, then you can say, oops, you know, I, I'm behaving inappropriately here. We don't tend to do this very much with people we know because, of course, we now rely on who they are. But we do tend to do this with the people that we encounter casually. And so awareness can help. It doesn't solve it, but it can make it better. Hmm. It It's kind of when you look at what's going on in the United States today um, and, again, even some places around the world – it, it sheds a light on things that you kind of go, ah, that makes a little bit more sense now where, um, you know, I, and I'm I'm taking a big leap here, but I'm like, going, you know, these people I grew up with, I'm now in my 50s and and these people I grew up with and I had thought I knew and, and had perceptions on who they were. And I'm sharing this isn't fully because of this, but but now I see their Facebook posts and I go, Oh my God, did you, did you always think that way or is this yeah. something new? And yeah. uh, you, you kind of have to wonder sometimes about, about some of that. And, and it's a really important piece, I think, to just realize that, hey, maybe this is something that if we actually just slowed down and took a little time to, to think about, maybe we can have a better perspective on things. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. And I would add that the, the downside of what's going on in America right now is that the two sides are so polarized that they look at each other in group terms rather than, than in individual terms. And I've got lots of good friends back in the States who I disagree with vehemently about politics. <laughs> like, I just don't even, I'm mystified. I can't understand them. <laughs> but they're still my friends, right? Yeah. And we still, yeah. they're, they're, we're all complicated individuals. Just because we don't agree on everything doesn't mean we shouldn't like each other. It doesn't mean we shouldn't be friends. And I think part of the problem that's happening is that people are, are, they feel so strongly about politics, which in a way is a good thing. You like the populace to be caught up in the, their governance, but they feel so strongly about it that they cut the ties between uh, uh, friends they have across political lines. And then what chances are there for any kind of reasonable compromise to ever be reached? Yeah. Well, and we, we talked with Annie Duke, you know, and one of the things that she mentioned on this whole tribalism piece that that's been happening is, you know, also then it, it's almost this halo effect. So, all right. So I, I find out that you disagree with me on, on this one piece that is part of this political identity. And now everything about you um, becomes suspect, right? So even yeah. if you, you have a great recipe for, you know, this fish recipe, yeah. I, I, I don't know, yeah. you, 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 you like the other guy, you know, yeah. uh, I, I don't know if I can trust you on that. And I think that to, to your point, right. There's, there's yeah. a little bit too much generalization across the, the thing. And, you know, we're more yeah. alike, I think, than, than we are different, but you know, yeah, that's, that's right. And how, even if you took people whose political ideologies are in complete contradiction to each other, if you sat down all the other things that they share in common, they would realize that they there's they still have a lot more in common than they have in difference difference to each other. And and of course, at a fundamental level, if we're talking about the United States, they're still Americans, right? They're still yeah. they they may disagree about how to get there, but their goals for the country are still the same. They're positive, right? They may they may strongly disagree about what that actually manifests itself as, but it doesn't change the fact that they oughtn't to be trying to work together. And so it's it's sad to me. I've been living outside the country for 20 years, but I just it's it feels like you're watching it disintegrate because the two sides are at each other's throats so much more that the, their inability to get along is of course disrupts the capacity of the country to move forward. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, Bill, what what is there any new research that you're working on? Anything that that is uh, that you're kind of saying, hey, this is some fun stuff that we're we're exploring. Yeah. So one of the things that we're doing right now, because our social functioning was so important for our ancestors, we're we're becoming very interested in well, what are the actual underpinnings of social skills? And so, if our brains evolved in order to be social machines, in order to be more effective in our groups, then lots of the fundamental underlying abilities that we have might be actually might have evolved for social purposes, not for the cognitive uses that we put them to today. And so we're in our lab, we're working on things like mental speed. It turns out that people are mentally quicker, um, are socially more successful because, of course, when you say something, it gives me more options of how I might respond if I can draw them up rapidly. We're working on, um, remember I talked about inhibition and your ability mm-hmm. to stop yourself from thinking and saying things. Well, that's super important and we're still working on that. But it's also the case that just because you stop yourself from saying the wrong thing doesn't mean you then know what the right thing is, right? And so what are the, ca- what are the capacities that allow you to then generate something that you should say? And so a big part of, um, of that, what we think is a big part of that is divergent thinking, your ability to think of lots of different kinds of ideas. Now, in the past, divergent thinking has been very heavily researched as an underlying component of creativity. And so what this suggests to me is that maybe creativity actually evolved not to make great art or to make do great science, but rather to try to persuade somebody to do what you really want. Like, I'm trying to get you to go watch the Schwarzenegger film with me, and you don't want to watch things blow up. I got to think of another reason why you'd enjoy the film anyway, because I don't want to go see the wrong cop that you have in mind. And so it could well be that our divergent thinking skills, which actually – one of the most important things that humans can do evolve for so the, um, its purposes in social persuasion rather than in um, creating new objects, creating new art, et cetera. So that's what we're mostly spending our time on now. Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. That is fascinating. That I'm, I can't wait to, to see that because uh, diversion thinking and creativity is, you know, been closely linked and I'd, I'd love yeah. to see this, this sort of new perspective. Um, so let's get back to music. Let's get back to. <laughs> sure, sure. Isn't it about time? Um, it is time. It's always time for you, Tim. You, there you, you brought go. up. You brought up the boss uh, as as a, a good uh, d- dinner guest. Um, why is that? Why Why would Springsteen be a good dinner guest for you? Well, you know his his lyrics are, my limited opinion, are better than anybody else's, and and his his reflection on the world and his thoughtfulness is unmatched. Now. He, I'm a, I'm a huge fan. I've seen him in concert many, many times. And, and he does say things like, look, you can't expect me in person to be as good as the me that you see in the lyrics, because of course, those have been honed for hours and hours. And, and when I speak in person, I'm just going to say random shit. Um, and, and of course, that's true, right? But on the other hand, when you listen to the guy in interviews, he's still super interesting and super smart. And so I would just I would love to chat with him. I would love, I mean, I'd love to chat with so many of those guys, of course, but, but I'd be super interested in his reflections on the world and, and, you know, even what his daily life is like. I mean, the guy just interests me. Yeah. 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 Totally fascinating. What, um, tell, tell us about, uh, your playlist these days. What are, what are you listening to? So look, I've got eclectic and old fashioned tastes and I've been, I, I, I subscribe to Rolling Stone so I can hit their new artists and really listen to them, but I hardly ever, follow them up. What I've been listening to a lot lately is, I, I hate to even admit this, but a lot of 70s stuff, like Tommy Bolin. Do you remember him? He was in Deep Purple. Yes. Um, I've, I've been, yeah. he's, his album, Private Eyes, is just, it's one of my, it's the, his use of spacing and his music, and, uh, and it's, he's an amazing guitarist. And of course, and what he sings about is sometimes a little silly, like I don't even know what the hell he's on about. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the uh, post toasty is one of my favorite songs. I'm not even sure what that it's like a cereal or something. I don't even know. I mean, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, and um, anyway, uh, and so old Leonard Skinner, old um, Led Zeppelin, um, old Boston. I used to love to ski and listen to Boston. And so it, all those songs that you know, they there's this interesting research that shows that your favorite music tends to be the music that was on when you were going into adulthood. There's this yeah. bump. Um, in, in a wonderful book, Everybody Lies, Seth Davidowitz, Seth Stevens Davidowitz, I guess the name. It's a great book, Everybody Lies. He does this great internet work to show that that's where we, that's our favorite music, the, the stuff that happened around when we went through puberty and a little after. And so anyway, those songs probably remind me of when I was young and strong and so, or stronger. And so <laughs> um, I, I still really enjoy them. But, but on the other hand, uh, do you guys know Israel, uh, let's see, Ka- Kama Kaviva Ole? 
Yeah, the uh, the the Hawaiian that that did the the over the rainbow tune. Izzy, exactly. Yeah, Izzy, yeah. exactly. Yeah. He's, he's uh, I somehow the combination of his voice and the ukulele blows me away, and I I, I just listen to that over and over again. So it's very random and eclectic. Yeah. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Do you listen to music while you work? Um, I can't have when I'm writing. I can't have lyrics, and so because uh, the the words interfere with what I'm trying to write. So then I have just musical, you know, just instrumental. And I love Mozart. I love um, the sonatas. Um, I love the the quieter stuff. That and but even then, it can be problematic if I get too caught up in it. I notice I haven't typed anything in a long time, and so I'm just sort of letting my mind flow <laughs> the music. Um, but if I'm drowning people out because I'm reading or or preparing something for teaching or whatever, then I love to have music on. Yeah. And what kind of music do you listen to when you're trying to drown other things out? Well, it's um, it's those Would, guys, right? Like, like oh, it is. You go to yeah. Boston, and yeah, Leonard exactly. Skinner Boston's and... perfect, right? Because they just start to wail away, and and I'm just lost. I, I don't <laughs> hear anything that's going on around me. Yeah. So I have to say, I saw Boston in concert. Really, and, uh, probably the most disappointing concert really? I've ever seen. Um, is, I don't want to because they are one of my favorite. They were one of my favorite yeah. bands growing up. I mean, it was yeah. just fantastic. But on stage, literally one of the most boring. So you talked about the boss, you know, and being up yeah. there, and and he, you know, he, he puts on a show, yeah, right? He really does, and and he talks with the crowd. And no, nope, they they literally, it's like the if they would have been in a studio, I think they would have been happier because uh, yeah. interacting with the audience, not up there at all. Well, it's all about like. Yeah, just yeah. Fine, so. That's too bad. That's, I mean, I think a lot of them are very introverted, and they find the audience not compelling in the same way that somebody like Springsteen can at yeah. least can get himself to do. Um, yeah, that's really sad to hear because I, you know, they I'm about the same age you are, and and so that was it was such a big thing to me in high school. We used to, you know, smoking weed and listening to Boston. Was, yeah. Um, oh man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it I was mean, legal I, I, in Alaska. Uh, there you oh, go. Well, wow. okay. Well, uh, no matter. Uh, but you know, I, I get it with. I, I certainly get it with Boston, though, because I mean, the band is basically Tom Schultz. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, it's it's his creation. And talk about the ultimate in- introvert. You know, I mean, he he created the first record himself. He played the drums. He played the gar- guitars. He played the bass. Sang all the vocals. He did, I didn't oh, know that. Oh, no, it's uh, 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 the, the, yeah. the first demo tracks were basically oh, all him. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah and, wow. and, and so he and could then just he brought in the band. band. Yeah. And he brought in a band, but I mean, he had the talent to just do all of it yeah. himself, and he just kind of had the the vision, and he could sit in his basement studio and just do it. So, yeah, people like that blow my mind. That's why I would love to mm-hmm. learn an instrument because you know you don't need to speak any other languages today. You walk into any place on the planet, you get out your phone and you say, translate what I'm about to say into the local language. You say it, you show it to them and they give you the beer you're after or whatever. But <laughs> but if you can play an instrument, which I can't, I'm a hopeless drummer after huge amounts of effort. Um, ah. if, you can, if you can play an instrument, then you, you can, you, you can speak to anyone. Yeah. So who's your favorite drummer? Look, um, uh, I love Rush. I love, well, probably actually my favorite of all time is Keith Moon. Um, yeah. But, wow. but there's, yeah, but there's a lot, I, I was a kid and he was, you know, epically interesting and good and, but, but I, I, I like tons of them. I mean, some of them are so, I, I'm so untalented that I just marvel at what they're capable of doing uh, as a, you know, without even paying attention that the things they can do. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, sad about Neil, Neil Parrott uh, yeah, pass, yeah. passing away this year. That's, that's yeah. That's I, I, I don't know if you guys read how he talked about how he had to, prepare longer and longer for tours as he, as he got older, like it used to be, he'd warm up for a week before the tour and then he'd warm up for two weeks and then he'd warm up for a month. I mean, just, you know, and how many drums he had and how fast he was, you can, I don't know how he could do that at at our age. Right. Yeah. Well, and the timing, right. I mean, that, that, that was the part about Neil's drumming was, it's just all over. I mean, it's, it's not a simple, you know, two, four beat. He's, he's all over. And then, and then you just got to admire him because, Hey, he wrote, you know, most of the damn lyrics for, for oh, all I didn't their, know that. good songs. Yeah. yeah he's a know, tremendous so he yeah. was the lyricist. Yeah. Wow. So he, he wrote yeah. most but, of those. But yeah. is what, well, what you mentioned Springsteen is like your, the all time, you know, band you love uh-huh. to go see the songs, yep. the lyrics. What is Max Weinberg? Just like toast. I mean, is he no, no, liver? Max is a good drummer. <laughs> and then he, he does interesting things the way he'll carry from one song to the next. He, he has some, 
clever ideas. And, and I think he's very gifted. I mean, you know, people talk about them being the best garage band ever. Right. Um, yeah. And, yeah. and I do think that they're very gifted, but you know, I compare them to, I don't know, um, bands like Led Zeppelin or, or, um, or Rush or the who um, I do. They, Look, they're great, and I love their music. I don't want to insult them in case they ever would listen to this. You know, they're <laughs> they're epically talented individuals, and I love the music they make. But the those other bands, you know, they're like how the the kind of music that they could create with just a cup, one person on a guitar and one person on the bass, and this this wall of sound that comes out of Led Zeppelin or that comes out of Rush, you know, it, or who it's it's stunningly impressive to me. Yeah. Uh, a, a good friend of mine is a pianist, a uh, keyboard guy that uh, played with Max uh, in, really? in some, some dates recently. Yeah. Wow. With what, what he calls the Max Weinberg experience. And he told a story about Max saying uh, one of his funniest moments on stage with Springsteen was, uh, you know, he said there's all kinds of cacophony, right? In every every show, right? And right. so Bruce would, would just turn over his shoulder and yell back, this is what we're doing. And then, you know, he'd and he'd go max one, two, right. three, four, and then they just kick it off. But in this one situation, Max didn't hear what the song was. <laughs> and so so Bruce is now at the microphone going, one, two, three, four. And Max, and like, Max holy crap. <laughs> has no idea what the song is. But yeah. he said, he said, I said, I just knew what the tempo was. And so I just started counting off a four, four. He said within a measure or two of, of Bruce starting to play. Oh, yeah. that's the song. Thank God. <laughs> so- right? Yeah. Well, do you guys know this story? And I'm going to butcher it because I can't remember the player, but there's this amazingly gifted guitar, multi-instrumentalist who talked about being on, um, he was in, Dylan studio for like a Rolling Stone and he didn't belong. He'd been brought in by a friend, but Dylan didn't recognize him and didn't know he didn't belong. And so he initially sat down to play the guitar and then the guitarist rocks up and starts warming up and the guy's so much better than he is. He's like, shit, I can't do that. So he goes over to the organ and he starts playing the organ and nobody shows up to play the organ. So he starts to play it and he's, he's playing it a tiny, he's obviously very gifted because he doesn't know the song. And so he's playing it a tiny bit behind. And so he's trying to play it quietly and Dylan stops and says, no, no, I like the way you're a tiny bit behind. Turn that up. And so now he's like <laughs> part of the, and I'm pretty sure it's like a Rolling Stone that that's the, um, that's the song where this is on. You guys could find it if you haven't yeah. seen this. I just, I remember reading the interview with him and it just so, it, it's so contrary to me that a human being could even do that, right? That yeah. hear a song for the first time and play it and play it reasonably and close enough that it makes it interestingly, you know, not quite connected, right? Yeah, well, and, and the fact that it's so interesting and so unique from that perspective that Dylan says, "No, yeah, turn this yeah, up." Yeah, <laughs> this exactly. isn't, you know, this is well, cool. And uh, it, it was Al Cooper. Yeah, I, I, he was. I, 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 it was Al Cooper, who was who was a super talented. Actually, he was a talented keyboardist. Did a lot of work with Mike Bloomberg, uh, Bl- Bloomfield, excuse me, uh, is in blues bands, um, playing blues, and so he he was actually pretty damn good. It wasn't yeah. like he was bad. Um, but yeah. but it is a fantastic story that that Dylan just said. Oh, I like that sound, and so <laughs> you stay. Yeah, that, but the yeah. fact that he wasn't even supposed to be there, I think that's yeah. the best part, right? It's like, yeah, oh, I'm yeah, sneaking in right. here. Yeah, yeah. you know, it's, it, it's the cre- yeah. it's our creative minds, right? We're having yeah. to be creative to fit into the social group and figure out how I can do this in a yeah. in a way that I'm not yeah. going to get kicked out and ostracized and yeah. have to go fend for myself out in the wild. Yeah, yeah. And it takes it takes a lot of guts to do those kinds of things, but of course, to if you want your chance to be part of history. Yeah, there you, you go. gotta take it. Yeah. yeah. Well, we had a chance to be a part of history tonight, getting to, to talk to with you, Bill, and this uh, has been fantastic. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for being our for being our guest on Behavioral Grooves. I really enjoyed chatting with you guys. Lots of fun. Thank you. Groovers, welcome to our grooving session where Tim and I groove on what we learned from our conversation with Bill, have a free flowing discussion, and talk about whatever else comes into our socially leaped brains. Fine book, wasn't it? My yes. gosh. Yes. Man, and Bill is just such a fantastic. Uh, just a fantastic guy. I mean, he's he ranks among one of those top people that I'd love to sit down and have a have dinner with. 
you know. Yeah. Well, you know, he he's a bright guy. He's yeah. you know, lived in Australia for 20 years and <laughs> which is cool in and of itself, oh, right? Oh my gosh, that's cool. There you go. All right. So Tim, what did you from our conversation with Bill? I mean, there's so many things we could talk about. What but what are what are some of the things that you want to groove on? Well, I want to start with uh happiness and social comparison because he the way he explained it really helped me get a better a deeper understanding of the importance of social comparison when when he says uh, what matters uh, you know what matters is how you stack up against those who are close around you right because if you stack up better than them you'll get picked by somebody to be their partner and you go well that's really important it that's is really, that's really really important and and uh, it reminded me of Dan Ariely's work. Uh, okay, with, which which of Dan Ariely's work? Well, he did some work when he was at MIT, uh, having people go into you know they they looked at, um, at at how people appear when they go into bars, basically to pick up other people, you know, right? Pe- you know, people you, that they're attracted to. So you take your wingman, right? Is that yeah, what yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. And, and, and you take this really hot wingman that attracts all of all of the opposite sex, right? To, you know, so that you can. <laughs> Well, or, not or if, same sex if you're in the, you know, if, that, right? yeah, yeah. But not if you want to get laid that night. <laughs> <laughs> the important thing, if you want to be the source of attraction, is for you to bring a slightly less attractive wingman with you. Oh, so you that. would bring me, in other words. <laughs> and then you would get all the chicks. Oh, that would be the deal. <laughs> Oh, no, th- it is interesting though, that social comparison, right? This idea, it, it kind of goes back to, hey, I don't have to be the fastest runner when that bear is chasing us. I just have to be a little <laughs> bit faster than you, right? That's right. So, but That's exactly you think right. about this from just happiness overall, right? And this idea that, you know, all of the, the research that looks at, hey, would you rather have a job that pays $100,000, uh, but everybody else is making uh, $110,000 right. or would you rather have a job making $80,000 and everybody else is making $75,000 exactly. and people yeah. pick that, that $80,000 because they're better off than those around them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, well, and we, we've had conversations about uh, w- with uh, Carnegie Mellon professors about people, women moving from one zip code to another. And uh, when they move from a really wealthy uh, zip code into a less wealthy zip code and the kinds of shoes that they buy end up influencing the people in the less wealthy area. Yeah. They're like, oh, well, that, you know, that new chick, she's, you know, really wealthy and she's got these kinds of shoes. Maybe that's what we should be buying. Well, but and you brought up this in, in the pre show, right? We're talking about Ed Diener's work of of stones in Fiji and they put the stone outside <laughs> right. their hut and the size of the stone is is relative to, you know, the wealth that they have. And so, you know, th- there's there's stone envy in Fiji, <laughs> right. right? It's just the size right. of the stone. It's like uh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Stone envy. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> what what, what right. did you want to groove on? Well, you know, I think there's just a, a lot uh, he talks a lot about this aspect of of cooperativeness, right? And in particular, as he's talking about the social leap, saying that, hey, what set us apart from the other primates is that we cooperated a lot more than, say, chimpanzees right. did. And I'm just wondering, given the state of affairs of how our world is, and in particular, how America is right now, are, are we moving away from that sense of cooperativeness? Are we Are we getting into these these tribal bands that, um, you, you know, uh, left and right Republican Democrat, and that we're not getting that. So we're no longer cooperating across as Americans. We are, we're cooperating within our band, but not across. And I think that has some potential negative consequences in the long term, hugely yeah. negative consequences in the long term. Well, it certainly feels like cooperativeness has and cooperation has brought us to the top of the food chain, but competitiveness is increasing uh, on an, on a regular basis in what we're going through right now. There is more competitiveness in the way that we think about uh, each other. Uh, and, and maybe this actually kind of leads into something I wanted to, to, to focus on, which is collectivism versus individualism. Um, and right. We've got this uh, we've got these societies. I, I, I think, Bill said, uh, societies that are shifting toward individualism rarely shift back. 
Uh-huh. Right. And and that not only are we losing a sense of cooperativeness, but we're increasing the the degree of individualism, at least in the United States. I I, I don't think that this is the case in every other country. But uh, but that's that kind of bums me out, you know. It is. It's sad when you think about this idea that you know we we know look we we evolve because of our ability to cooperate, and if we are moving further away from that cooperation, that we're moving into this this competition focus, that we need to beat them, that this idea that it is less about us as a collective, but more about me as an individual or me and my my group. Um, you know, and I guess you could probably interpret some of this as it is still collectivism. It's just collectivism at a at a smaller model, which is probably how we evolve. So there's probably right. some aspect of this that is actually reflective of our evolutionary history because we didn't we didn't evolve, you know, millions of years ago or hundreds of thousands of years ago in these large societies. We had a collectivism, but it was in a smaller group. It wasn't just our familiar group, our family group, but it was these these tribes that we had. And maybe there's a certain point that, hey, we just aren't equipped to really think about our tribe as being this much larger tribe that in, embraces more people and larger group of, you know, beyond our local community, beyond our, our state, beyond our, our, you know, political affiliation up to our country, up to the world. That might be harder for us. That's a really keen observation, Kurt. I, I really like that idea. And I think about how, uh, for instance, the Europeans at, at some point uh, decided, well, Europe isn't big enough for us. We're going to start exploring the rest of the world and see where we can settle. And, you know, in the in the late uh, 17th or early 17th century, you know, they start coming to North America. Right. And so they're kind of pulling away from the, that tribe and building their own, uh, their new tribes, you know, se- separate tribes and uh, which end up becoming America. I, I've also seen this with, uh, with Christianity, you mm-hmm. know, that, that, that we start with, we, if we start with, with Jesus and one tribe that by the year 300, we've got uh, Constantine uh, creating a Greek Orthodox version and we've got the Romans creating the Roman uh, Catholicism. And then, you get into the 15th or 16th century and now we've got Protestantism. Yeah. And you got Luther and, and then and, everything and that Calvin and, off from that. Yeah. yeah and, and that's bifurcated dozens and dozens of times as, as well. So, so maybe you're right. Maybe we're just not really well equipped for dealing with really big tribes. So uh, later on in the episode, he, he talks, we started talking a little bit about political differences, right? And he said this, and I thought this was really key. He said, The downside of what's going on in America right now is that the two sides are so polarized that they look at each other in group terms rather than in individual terms. And maybe that's part of this. We get so big that we have to, that we can't understand that, that the people that are on the other side are mothers and fathers and, and they have, you know, friends that go out and play pool or swim or, you know, drink beer and watch football, whatever that would be, that would make them an individual to us that they, that we have to label them as they are, they are left or they are right. They are Democrat or they are Republican, as opposed to they are mothers and fathers that love their children. Um, They have hopes and dreams just as you and I do. And we, we, we miss that. And if we, if we can't get back to that, then I, I'm really worried. Uh, Annie Duke talked about uh, a conversation we had about, uh, I think it was salmon. And she said, hey, I like salmon. Do you like salmon? Yeah, I like salmon. Oh, that, that's pretty great. Um, are, you a, you know, are you on my side of the, the political scheme or not? Uh, oh, I'm not. Oh, well, you know, I don't want your salmon recipe then. <laughs> yeah. Like, well, what the hell is that about? Yeah, that has salmon <laughs> recipe has nothing to do with the other aspect of this. And that that gets to the point. I think there's a lot where because we have labeled these people as opposite or out out group right that out uh-huh. group x and mm-hmm. and thus it, you know to a certain degree the out group isn't just an out group they are an enemy 
out group. And, and yeah. so if you are part of the enemy, then I cannot take anything that you say, which goes into, again, I think we've, we've said this before. There was, you know, shortly after um, Trump became president, there was a Val Victorian uh, presentation that this Val Victorian did in, in one of the more, you know, Southern towns basically made this statement and he attributed it to Trump and everybody cheered and they said, oh, wait, I'm sorry, I, I misattributed that. That was a statement that was from Obama. And they booed. It's the same statement, but because right, the messenger right. changed and the messenger is in an outgroup that is opposite. And so thus, you know, we can't take anything that they say. Oh, well, if it's good, it goes back to this, this piece that we talked about, you know, just recently about rational versus irrational and reality versus this perception of reality, right? Um, <laughs> right. That we were talking about with, with Michael, uh, Michael Halsworth and, and um, Elspeth Kirkman. And this idea that, well, if the statement is real, if, if we believe that statement, then it shouldn't matter who said it, but that right. isn't how we operate. And that's, that's yeah. a really scary piece for me. Yeah. Do you have a good salmon recipe, by the way? You know, I just, I, I put some olive oil on it and some, <laughs> you know, sea salt and sometimes a little, uh, you know, just a little herbs de Provence and, and, and we're, we're off and I, I grill it six minutes on a side. <laughs> awesome. I, I don't turn mine. I, I, I only grill it the uh, skin side down. That's, that's tends to be Oh my no, you gotta get the, you gotta get the grill marks on both. Uh, oh, because yeah. if you don't do that, um, you don't get the grill marks on it. How does that how oh my I God, survive? I can have, I, you must, <laughs> you must have an, be on the opposite side. I don't like your salmon recipe. I don't like you now. There you go. Okay. Can we just wrap up with uh, deceptive information? That conversation with Bill was, I thought was really, really important when we're talking about being suspicious of friends. Oh, yeah. um, and, you know, and he says that, um, you know, if you're if your suspicions of your friends all the time, they're they're just not going to like you, right? And you're you're just going to be too damn busy trying to figure out what they're doing wrong. Oh, and is that why you don't like me? Because I'm always suspicious <laughs> of what you're doing. Oh man, I knew it. I, I thought it was. I I'm knew suspicious. you were you were you were conniving there. <laughs> I thought it was because I was suspicious of everything you were doing. But <laughs> but um, but it got me wondering. Are there different moral foundations that might find this appealing or personality types? Like, uh, you know, if you mean that ones that are more suspicious. Yes. Than others? Yeah. Okay. That, that, that is, is it possible that your personality might l lead you to be more suspicious of, of other people? And then there's a part of me that says, well, how much of that can we control? Yeah. I mean, that's it. I have no, you know, I, I'm not a, I, I've, I've done a little research on personalities as part of my, my, um, dissertation. However, I, I'm not really a, an expert on that. So I don't know if there are personalities. I mean, you would think that high neuroticism would lead people to be more suspicious. So in, in right. the ocean model, right? So yeah. maybe that is true. Um, so with that, I mean, that's an interesting concept. We need, we need somebody who's listening to go out and study that. And, and then let us know and we'll have you on the show. Yeah, exactly. Let's get a guest to, to help reveal that. Yeah, um, there we go. Very cool. No, it's an interesting concept though. And I really, it's just, it makes, makes implicit sense, right? This, if you're suspicious of your friends or your spouse or your people that you're working with, you know, particularly about their intentions, right? It goes back to the fundamental attribution error, right? Are you, yeah. what are you attributing to their you know, their, their thought pattern behind why they're doing what they're doing. And if you attribute that to something being sneaky or deceitful, uh, you're not going to really, th they're going to figure that out and you're going to be kind of a lonely, sad person. Yeah. So maybe go back to Hanlon's razor, right? Don't, <laughs> don't attribute to malice that could easily be described as stupidity. <laughs> One of my favorite sayings of all time. It's pretty terrific. All time. And I always forget, I always forget who who said it? I was like, it's somebody's razor. I and I always forget <laughs> Hammond, but Gillette you know. or yeah, no. Schick. You know, yeah, there you go. Uh, and can I just uh, end my desire to groove on stuff by saying that one of the coolest things that Bill had to say was, if you can play an instrument, you can speak to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> How about that? How about that? If you can if you can play an instrument, you can speak to anyone. It is the universal language. I thought that was fantastic. Well, there's an emotional piece of that, right? I mean, that, really? that, that 
I, I just sent you that uh, article, and I can't remember who it's from, yeah. about the emotional reaction that happens in our brains when we're listening to music, right? right. That, that it, it taps into some of those emotional components. And it, it's true, right? It doesn't matter if it's beating drums, if it's playing guitar or music or piano, or singing, vocal, whatever that would be. You don't have to understand the words. You just feel that. And when you feel that, it, it releases those... Uh, those those dopamine release and other neurochemicals that it talks about in in that article. Yeah, I, I mean, they, they even said uh, that that people uh, that they, they, when you experience the chills, like yeah. you know, you experience that, that musical, little, like, ooh, that's ooh. so cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, and and that that's pretty pretty great that you you know that they can actually measure that on a PET scan, and I think that that's fantastic. That there's more neuroscience around this. Yes, uh, and and I always love you know, the, the confirmation bias of seeing all the things that support <laughs> the idea that <laughs> at least, you know, fun. you're confirming your own bias. Yeah. On that. yeah. Uh, but I, and just a, cur- a curiosity, uh, you, you played guitar for a while, you know, a while ago. I, I, no, I, I, I learned a couple chords from a book. Okay. So, would you, would you want to play an instrument? Would you want to be proficient? Oh in yes. Instrument? I would love to be able to play an instrument. Wh- and what instrument would that be? If I had, if I had to choose just one, it would be piano. I would I would yeah. love to be able to be, uh, I mean, not a virtuosity of piano, but just being able to to play. I mean, I can't even read music, right? So, and and my I'm tone deaf, and so all of these things are are you know stacked against me. That you're being not, said, you are I not could. tone deaf. You're you're I've recorded with you. You're not you're not tone deaf. I am tone deaf. <laughs> You tell me C, I go, I don't know what C is. There you go. Right. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Anyway, no, I would love to, to, to learn like, piano yeah. and then guitar after that. And then, I don't know, tuba, maybe something. <laughs> <laughs> have to build up your armbusher for that. Well, so. I have no clue what an armbusher is. <laughs> is that how much I can blow? I, I'm a pretty good blowhard. How, so how, strong, you your, how strong your, your mouth and lips are. Basically. Okay. Yeah. All right. I can. Right. Exactly. Yeah. There that's you go. that's what you got to do. Yeah. All righty. Uh, <laughs> we, we have degraded I, way way down. I I apologize to all our listeners that you have to listen to Tim and me just go down these <laughs> really bad rabbit holes. But hopefully, uh, the rest of the episode was was interesting for you. And hang on, because we're gonna we're gonna come back with a bonus track. Hey Groovers, this is Kurt with our bonus track for our episode with Bill Von Hippel. Bill came to us as a referral from Roy Baumeister and we're glad to have met Bill. His intellect sparks great research and he did a terrific job of articulating some intriguing aspects of how we humans evolved the ways that we did. We discussed the important aspect of how context matter when it comes to happiness. We typically like to feel that we're comparing ourselves favorably to those around us, and we tend to avoid comparisons with those who we wouldn't compare well to. That led to a discussion about Bill's book on the social leap and how important it is for us to remember that it is our collaboration, our collective abilities as a species that set us apart from the rest of the animal kingdom. This unique capability for humans to cooperate is an important reminder these days. We also talked about the futility of not trusting your friends and the likely risk of getting lots of false positives from motivated thinking. Something that caught us off guard was the reminder that as we age, we are likely to increase our reliance on stereotypes that can lead to prejudice. As Bill suggested, we need to stop ourselves from this unnecessary learning by slowing down and asking if we're feeling this way because of the person's group membership or gender or whatever else. Stop and give some consideration to it. And that leads us to our groove idea for the week. Bill, leveraging Bill's comment uh, that stereotypes can lead to prejudice, think about a stereotype you hold about a particular person. Ask yourself, am I reacting to this person because of who they are or because of the group that I'm associating them with? Particularly in this age of political division, think about it from that perspective as well. Are you really reacting to who they are as an individual or because you're placing them in some other group? All right. As always, 
let us know what you think. If you've tried it out, let us under let us know what uh, the results were, and uh, have this discussion with your friends. We'd like to hear what you learned from this. And that wraps up another episode of Behavioral Grooves. We appreciate you listening, and we hope, hope, hope that you enjoyed it. Now go out and make uh, this week great, and go find your groove.